I was looking at the website, and it, did you just interview Hugh Cornwall or something? Yes, I did. Wow. Yeah. One of my, uh, my old heroes as a child. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, mm. oh, my God. It was the first band I was ever genuinely obsessed with was The Stranglers, from mm. about the age of nine years old. Wow. <laughs> wow, that's kind of, like, dirty for a nine-year-old, no? Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I can imagine that the, uh, the, the versions of the Strangler songs were pretty pretty good then. Oh yeah, no, they were they were great. They were doing two sets in the clubs. The first yeah. set was a mixture of Strangler songs and his solo work, and then the second set was the entire first Strangler's album straight through. Wow! Holy! <laughs> 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 oh my God! I mean, it is it really seriously. It's probably the most. It's probably Killing Joke. And the Stranglers were the f- most significant bands that hit me as uh, a, you know, at a really young age, basically. And the Stranglers was the first. I first saw them live in uh, 1979 as a 10-year-old, and uh, my my mom and my stepdad took me. They were with me, you know. They took me to the, the concert, basically. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but they were Stranglers fans as well of the first couple of albums. So it was it was all good, you know. But what was that like for a 10-year-old? Pretty awesome, really. I mean, I didn't have much else to put it up against, you know what I mean? I, didn't, I think, you know, the way I'd lived already, the way my, my parents were, which were basically, they were sort of ex-hippies who then got into the whole punk thing. I think what got them into punk in 77 was Lou Reed. They were big followers of Lou Reed, and I think Lou Reed was on the front of one of the big music press in about 75, 76. I think that was after Metal Machine music and stuff, wasn't it? When he became himself, he looked quite sort of you know, it's quite punky and all the rest of it. And I think yeah. Lou Reed was their avenue into into punk rock in 76, 77. So both my mum and my stepdad were buying, you know, they bought like the first Clash album, Sex Pistols, The Damned, Stranglers. I heard those records in about, when I could just about pay attention, when I was about nine years old in 1978, and I heard the first Stranglers album. Something about that just, even at that young age, captured me entirely, you know. It, it, it was such a huge influence on my music as well. I mean, it's like the bass sound in The Stranglers was, has impacted me to this day. There's nothing, not, not much like it in the world, you know, apart from maybe the, the, the early Johnny Whistle's bass sound in, in The Who, do you know what I mean? It's clearly an influence on J.J. Bunnell, but, I mean, that bass sound, I completely, we ripped off with Godflesh, you know, that was the whole idea, was to take the bass sound, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and Hugh Cornwell, I mean, as a guitar player, was was a pretty stark guitar player. Totally, an absolutely another com- total inspiration to my guitar playing. Even uh, as a young kid, I mean, when I first tried to learn guitar, you know, it was essentially trying to learn some Strangler songs. You know, oh, that's great. You know, and and just yeah, the way he plays is that you know it's textural and minimal. Mm-hmm. You know, and that definitely, not that I could articulate that as a 10-year-old, 10, 10 but eventually, you know, came to realize what it was, what the magic was that, that influenced my guitar playing, you know. And what's your favorite Stranglers album? Uh, for me, it's without doubt Black and White. Oh, me too. You as well. <laughs> wow, that's yeah. funny. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, Curfew. Oh, my God, the whole sound of that album, the, everything about it, to be honest, the whole, the whole package, the sleeve, absolutely magical, magical record. One of my close friends who I work with in a number of bands, actually, um, Dave Cochran, who I work with in, like, Grey Machine, Head of oh, David, right. and all this sort of stuff, he's... When I first met him, when we were both about 15 or something, he was another huge Stranglers obsessive, and he still goes and sees any show he can, you know. But he still lives in Birmingham. I live in the middle of nowhere, so it's, it's about a two-hour trip for me to get to a city, so it's, I don't do shows that often anymore. Can you just outline what's been going on for you in the last year or so? Loosely speaking, the last year has seen, um, besides the Godflesh Reformation, which is a, a pretty big deal for me, and a big deal for a lot of people, I think. It is. Um, I mean, uh, the last year, uh, oddly enough, Yezu has been averagely quiet until now, anyway. And I mean, there is a there is a new Yezu release, but it's not new per se. Material. Exactly. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's a double CD re- reissue, essentially, on Hydrahead of the first Yezu release, which was on a very tiny UK label on a limited. CD pressing. It was actually recorded after the self-titled Yezu album, but the Yezu self-titled album, there was a few scheduling things with Hydrahead where it, it, it didn't really come out until about a year after I completed the album, you know. I had an avenue and a couple of songs which I extended, which were the Heartache songs, 
um, on a label which was a tiny UK label which didn't have any any scheduling issues whatsoever so they put it out real quick you know in 2004 but it never really got any substantial exposure nor substantial distribution either so it was sort of a bit of a quiet release you know and um, it's nice now for Hydrahead this many years later to reissue it mm -hmm. and it's, it's coupled with uh, an unreleased EP which also was recorded around 2004 which I just sat on for years because I've been so busy pursuing other ideas. You know, sometimes I think a lot of people are probably aware of this with the whole industry and that scheduling can become a really big thing. You know, if a label can't fit in a release within an X amount of time, it can sit and stew, you know, and I can end up working on something else in the interim. I get impatient with records, you know, I'm one of them people who like, once I finish the record, I want it out. And it can be quite frustrating to find out that the schedule with a label doesn't permit this, you know, it can be nine, twelve months down the line. I mean, by the time a record comes out, sometimes I've left that record, you know. Right. And it's funny then, you you know, you're talking about it again and all the rest of it. So, I mean, that's 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 the deal with, with, with Yezu. I mean, amongst the last year, I mean, prior to the last year, I feel myself, and I think a lot of people feel the same, that Yezu releases were saturating the world. <laughs> I was quite enamoured with releasing as much as possible because I was writing a lot and I was recording a lot. It took a lot of these releases for it to just occur to me that I should just try and slow down, you know.